Hello, I'm back. I finally found some time and more importantly the headspace to provide a little bit of a um, channel update to let you know what's been happening and where we're going to go from here. It's fair to say that 2020 has turned into the year that none of us wanted. We're sort of all in a position where we're dealing with things and, and that resilience is being tested like never before. Uh, started with the bushfires, obviously here in Australia, um, then COVID and now um, racism and all the protests and everything that's, that's taking place uh, in America, but also around the world. I was uh, part of a protest here uh, in Adelaide just a couple of days ago. Uh, look, in, in this video, I just want to give you an update on what's been happening and I suppose give you my perspective. I don't for a minute um, feel that you know, I've been particularly hard done by or I've got it worse than anybody else in this crisis. Uh, there's a lot of people that have got it a lot worse than I have and you know, very much I'm, I've got a privileged position. Um, but I've got a, quite a unique unique perspective, I suppose, in that I've gone through this COVID crisis wearing three hats. The first being an aviation YouTuber, somebody that's uh, loved uh, aviation for as long as I can remember and has obviously been doing these videos for a few years. Um, secondly, I'm a part owner of the family touring business. We run small group tours through Bunnick Tours um, from Australia all over the world. And when COVID broke out, we did have customers all over the world. Um, so that's given me a, you know, I've been in the thick of things there. And thirdly, uh, for the last five years, I've been the chair of the Council of Australian Tour Operators. It's the industry body that uh, represents the land supply of the Australian travel industry. Basically, our members, wholesalers, tour operators, land supply companies, tourism offices. We supply the travel product that is sold through travel agents, online, and also direct to clients. So I've had this national role as well, which has uh, involved a fair bit of government liaison and helping to set the policies and helping our members go through it. So with all of those things in mind, I thought I'd, I'd give you an update on just what I've been going through in these last uh, three months and where I see the industry and where I see aviation going forward. Now, of course, it wouldn't be one of my videos without a uh, cheers. Here's to a great non-flight. Yes, here's to a good little chat. Hopefully I don't rave and rant too, uh, too much. Because I must say that right in the middle of the thick of things, when I was at, I suppose, my lowest, uh, two of my very good friends and fellow YouTubers, uh, Paul Stewart and Jeb Brooks, came through and uh, completely unbeknown to me, had contacted my family, got the address and, uh, and sent through a, yeah, a bottle of Applewood uh, Australian gin. Um, never have I uh, been more appreciative. It's, uh, it's been a godsend. So thanks guys and uh, cheers. Here's to a great night. So what happened with COVID? Well, it was a very slow burn for uh, the travel industry. In the beginning, obviously, just in China, then there was that cruise ship in uh, Japan and the, the neighboring countries there were, were impacted. Then it moved on to Italy. So as, um, as it spread, tours to those areas were all impacted. Japan, uh, China tours were stopped first, then our tours to Korea and Japan were stopped. And it was really a wait and see. And unfortunately, with, with COVID, it very quickly turned quite political. With, on one side, you had the people saying, oh, this is just a flu, this is, there's nothing to worry about here. And others were saying, this is Armageddon and there's, it's outbreak and the whole world needs to shut down immediately. And there was these competing forces within uh, world media and, and within society. And the travel industry was sort of caught in the middle. So, and we were looking at that since the beginning of February. Then suddenly in the beginning of March, this thing spread. And it spread like wildfire and within, uh, within a two or three week period, it seemed like every weekend, there was something, it was a new outbreak somewhere. Now it was the Middle East and then it was India and then it was uh, in Vietnam and then Peru and then uh, North America and then other parts of Europe, Spain. Um, and on the 15th of March, on the very day that Bunnick Tours turned 25, we made the decision to suspend our entire touring program around the world. We 
stopped every single tour. And the very next day, the Prime Minister came onto the country and said, we are um, suspending, uh, you know, we're closing the borders. And by then, a lot of international borders were closing already. So it's quite ironic, we'd spent 25 years building up this industry, or this in, our company, and then on the very day that we turned 25, we actually had to stop. And we found ourselves in a completely unprecedented situation. Um, and speaking uh, afterwards in one of the hookups with Department of Foreign Affairs that we, we had through Cato, um, none of us had ever prepared for any of this because none of us ever expected that there would be a do not travel warning on New Zealand. That you would have to ask permission from the Australian government to be able to leave our country. It was just unfathomable. So within all of this, you know, where, where our heads are going crazy, um, we had to try and get all of our clients home. And this being March, it was just before the European season started. Um, the Middle East season is still in full swing, so we had a lot of groups in uh, Egypt and, and Jordan. We also had groups in Namibia, in Kenya and Tanzania, in Vietnam, in India, in Peru, in the Galapagos Islands, uh, in Ecuador. And everybody that was, that was caught overseas was caught up in a situation that even a week before wasn't foretold. You know, Peru went from having fully open borders to having fully closed borders and a curfew within two days. So that meant the whole travel industry was scrambling. Um, Morocco, similar. You know, whereas on the Monday we thought, yes, the tour that's there can continue on for the next seven days and, and finish their tour. Um, two days later, we're scrambling to get flights for them out because all the hotels in the whole country were being told they had to shut down the airports were being closed. So from a, um, a travel perspective, a travel industry perspective, for us, it was all hands on deck. It was crisis management 101. Within that, obviously, um, here in, in Australia, things were being locked down and people were needing to work from home. And um, within, our, within our business, it's my mother, my brother and myself who, uh, who own the business. And then we've got our management. We've got a very strong management team. And they really came to the fore. My brother handles all of the staffing uh, issues and, and operational side of the, of the business with, with our general manager there. And um, they arrange with our IT guys for everybody to work from home. Um, uh, my mother was, uh, was working with our operational guys to get all of the trapped passengers overseas back into Australia. And um, I was helping to coordinate the, the business finances, the getting the messaging out, the daily updates that we were uh, sending to our staff and, and to customers. And at the same time, um, working with Cato on a national basis, at, uh, you know, crisis response meetings, working with, with DFAT, working uh, subsequently with the ACCC, working with AFTA, the Australian Federation of Travel Agents, to, to try and get a, a coordinated approach. Um, to say that it was hard work, it was, it was hard work. It was, it was tough on, on all of us. Um, that were that were going through that at the time and it was um at the same time i suppose fascinating because you know we're an industry that has uh has external factors and crises happening whether it be an ash cloud or a volcano eruption somewhere or a revolution or say the arab spring in, in egypt or um, unfortunately terrorism uh, at, at times as well or we saw with the bushfires here in australia where that disrupts travel um, so we're a resilient industry, but never have we had a situation where the entire world and all travel has stopped. So trying to come to terms with that within our, within our heads and seeing the, the trouble that this was causing around the world, that was something at a new level. Um, and at that stage, my work on my YouTube channel just stopped. I just didn't have this, the headspace for it. Um, it didn't feel right. I literally had a Qatar Q, uh, Q class, uh, a Q suite video that was uh, going in for final editing. I just needed to do some final edits and uh, we'll get Chris, my video editor, to, to do those edits and I could upload it. But it just felt wrong. Didn't want to do it. I, honestly, it didn't feel right to, to upload. And at the same time, um, it got sad. You know, I, it, it got... As things dragged on, and then you started to see the impact that this was having 
around the world and in the industry that I, that I love. And the travel industry is made up of people that are passionate about travel. You know, the reason so many people go into the industry is because they love, they love traveling themselves, but they love bringing people together and connecting cultures and stuff. And that's what our tours were about. To suddenly stop that and have to undo those, those processes is, is heartbreaking. But even more heartbreaking was the fact that so many good people were suddenly out of work. You know, airline staff being made redundant, being stood down. Just in our sector here in, in uh, Australia, the, the Cato members, 35% of staff have, have lost their jobs. Uh, and so many good people. That's just on the tour operators and wholesaler side of things, just in Australia. Right? Within the travel agencies, within the hotel sector, with the, at the airports, all the people I see in the lounges and stuff, um, the flight attendants. Qantas is currently operating at 5% domestically what they were pre-COVID. Yeah. It's awful. It, it, it really is. There's so many really good people, friends have, have left the industry. And we just hope that one day they can come back. So, uh, you know, as I say, it, it was very sad um, and depressing. And did I have time or the inclination and the headspace to work on my channel? No, and it just didn't feel right. It really didn't. Um, and you know it's it's the help of, of friends and and colleagues within the industry that helped us all get through seeing what's happened with aviation you know looking at the um the 747 from qantas and the 747 from klm now i was born in holland so i've got an aff affiliation there and you know i did that great video on the uh the combi the 747 combi uh into chicago from uh, from Amsterdam last year. Great, great for you. That's where I met uh, Jeb, in, uh, and he met me uh, in Chicago. We, we flew down to uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. But the fact that, you know, the KLM 747 and, and the Qantas 747, such iconic aircraft, both had their last ever passenger flights on the same day. And in essence, they were probably, you know, passenger rescue flights, getting people back to their home country of COVID. That's sad. You know, these fleets, they deserve a, they deserve a better send off than what they've got. And it's the same with, with so many staff. So this is end of the careers of so many really good people within this industry. And those are careers that should be celebrated. Not go out like a whimper like this it's it's not it's not good so one of the first things that i'll do is when things are back to normal is we're going to have a few drinks uh, we're going to celebrate the people that that we've lost here we're going to come together and and you know send them off properly uh, because i think we owe it we owe it to them but we also owe it to um to our industry you know as i said before this is tested a lot of our resilience on a personal level, a company level, a country level, and an industry level. But we're also taking the opportunity now to say, okay, well, what can we do better? You know, as individuals, as companies, as industries. You know, taking the time to actually stop and enjoy. The fact that I've been walking in to work every day and, and walking home and walking through the parklands where it's, it's beautiful, of just appreciating nature, fantastic. From a company perspective, how can we do things differently? We've actually just launched a marketing company. It was a, an idea that my brother came up with. Our marketing department is, we really want to keep them intact because we need them when the borders eventually reopen. So Little Windmill Marketing was launched on Friday um, where people can now use the Bunnick Tours marketing department to help build their own brands. Uh, so yeah, have a look out for uh, for that. I'll put the link in that below as well. And even to help the uh, uh, those guys basically for us to, to keep our marketing department. Here. And it could end up being a whole new division for the next you know, 10, 20, 25 years of our business. But then as an industry, how do we reform? And through Cato, we've been, we've been looking at, you know, what are some of the things as an industry that we need to do better? What do we learn from this? 
or communication and having, you know, getting our story out earlier is one of those things. But how can we make the processes better? So if we ever go through a nightmare like this again, there's a better outcome for everyone. Hopefully the world will come, uh, come out of this better as well. Obviously it's helped the environment. Um, we've accelerated our program to become carbon neutral in everything that, that we do. And again, it's something that we should have done years ago. But it was always on the to-do list and we never got around to it. With the bushfires, we actually said, no, yes, we now need to work on this. And with COVID, it was very easy to say, oh, no, that's going to cost money. We're not going to do it. But we're actually doing it now. We're, we're continuing. And that's one of the things we're not stopping. And I think if each one of us individually and, and, and collectively work at how we can do things better, how we can come out of all of this better, then the world's going to be a better place. The fact that um, all these protests are happening with racism at the moment, the fact that racism is still an issue in 2020, just the fact that domestic violence is still an issue in 2020, I find absolutely appalling and abhorrent. It shouldn't be. And where there's institutionalised a systemic racism in the system, let's take this opportunity to get, fix that. Let's fix that. You know, and I know I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going off track a little bit, but that, I suppose, is, is where my head's been at. Because there's a lot of stuff happening around the world at the moment. And surely... We're not going through all of this not to come out better at the other end. Yeah. So where does, where's, what's going to happen to my channel? Um, and what's going to happen with, uh, with aviation into the future? Well, my channel will be back. I will get onto that Qatar Q suite and that will be the, the, the next upload. Hopefully have that within the next couple of weeks. I've then got two other videos that are, that are in production. One is an, uh, an A220 with Air Sinai from Tel Aviv through to, to Cairo that I filmed in January. And the second one is, or the third one, um, was then the, uh, the final leg of that uh, Air China trip I did um, coming back from London to Australia uh, late last year. So this is the 777 Air China from Beijing through to Sydney. Now, I, I did review the A330 with Air China and that was pretty ordinary. Uh, so the, the triple seven was uh, was a lot better. Um, so they're coming up. After that, I actually don't have anything. So my next um, my next trip, I can't wait for that to uh, to happen. At today, while I'm filming this, I was actually supposed to be in Kazakhstan, um, escorting the very first departure of a new tour called the Five Stands. Uh, that uh, uh, I was really really looking forward to. All of April, I was supposed to be. Uh, all over Europe doing tour guide training, including visiting for the very first time uh, Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Again, I was really looking forward to that. That hasn't happened. But I will get out there and I will travel again. You know, I'm, I'm an optimist and always have been. And I know that however tough this will be as a company, we will survive. And as an industry, we will survive. And as a, you know, the good things will come out of this. So, yes, we will all be traveling again. I do fear, though, from an aviation perspective, that maybe the golden age of travel has stopped and paused, or the golden age of flight has paused for a while. It's sad when you hear that Etihad is uh, looking at suspending all its A380s, you know, and, and Qatar the same. You know, those onboard bars and the showers in first class and the apartments and the residence and stuff, that's a pretty, uh, a pretty special experience that may now disappear. Um, the cost cutting is going to be a natural part of the aviation industry as they recover from this. So what are some of the things that we took for granted which are maybe now not going to be there? Hopefully, you know, before too long everything sort of comes back from a service perspective. Um, countries like Australia, cities like Adelaide, um, air capacity is going to be an issue. We spent so many years building up the flights, uh, the international airlines flying out of Adelaide, we're now going to need to go through that again. Uh, Singapore Airlines is coming in again in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, they're recommencing their flights. And um, I think from September 
Emirates have listed that they're going to be uh, flying here again. But that also depends on what happens with the Australian borders. And I can tell you that we've painted ourselves into a bit of a corner there. Whereas the, um, uh, the rest of the world you know, suffered far more than what we did from a COVID perspective, we were able to, to escape and avoid the worst of the medical um, impacts. We've got a bit of an island fortress mentality here. So what happens there? How do you climb back down from that? The borders will open to New Zealand and, and to some Pacific Islands, and we've been talking with Department of Foreign Affairs, DFAT, about, about this, and you know, as an industry sharing, uh, sharing our concerns and, and um, our opinions on, on this, and we're working closely together with them on how we can safely reopen borders. But a lot of this will be dependent upon a risk analysis, bilateral agreements. So countries like Japan and Korea and Taiwan will probably open before countries in South America. Countries in South America and Africa, um, North America will take a lot longer to open. You know, is it a wait for a vaccine or a cure or for the virus to disappear completely? And in Europe where you know, the level of infection has pretty much been similar in, in a lot of countries, opening those borders up within Europe is, is going to come much quicker than the opening up of the Australian borders. So as a whole country, I think we're going to get cabin fever. Uh, so it might be a little while before uh, we can venture to, uh, to Europe or to North America. We hope that it'll be sooner, but we don't know. Um, obviously, a lot of airlines have gone into financial difficulty. Um, we hope that they come out and that aviation remains strong because all of us need a strong aviation sector. The fact that some of these older aircraft have disappeared and they're focusing now on the, the newer, more fuel efficient models is good for all of us. It's good for the planet, it's good for emissions. So, you know, I think there are bright sides to all of this as well. I have no idea how long I've been going for. Yeah, it's about 29 minutes or something according to this. So. Uh, it is time to uh, wrap this up and just say thank you to everybody who has sent me messages of support. I really, really appreciate it. I know there's a lot of people send me messages via Instagram um, and I haven't responded yet. I just haven't had the headspace for it. I have read them and I do really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, everybody else that's reached out via email or, or comments on videos, um, thank you. It's, it's meant a lot, it, it really has. It's, um, yeah, there's been some dark days in all of this and you know, it's a bit of soul searching, but that's good. I think we, we all go through that at some stage and um, we will all come out, of, uh, come out of this. So soon enough, we'll be back in the air and um, enjoying the world of travel and, and hopefully, um, I'll get to see uh, some of you guys on, on my travels and uh, we can get our team, our Bunnik Tours team, especially all the tour guides and, and all of our local partners around the world uh, back, up and, back up and running. Cheers. Thank you for watching and uh, yeah, all the very best in the, uh, the months ahead.